are now live. It's amazing to have an opportunity to actually share with these great people that we have on the panel tonight. And so my name is Dale Borland. And I'm Cheryl Duick, and I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. We have um, La Lady Londa Lamard, I, I said it the French way, sorry, <laughs> or Larmond, um, who is the senior worship leader at Rima Christian Fellowship. Is that right? Ministries. Ministries, Ministries. sorry. Mm -hmm. And she's also a Covenant and Award winning gospel artist. So welcome, Londa. Thanks for having me. And we have also, all the way from Guelph, Ontario, uh, Dennis Gray, who is a technical director for um, Cartwright, did I say that right? Cartwright Presbyterian Church in right. Guelph. Um, he's in charge of the live, the live services and all that and has um, and um, we just want to welcome you. Thank you, Dennis, well, for being here. Thanks for inviting me. And all the way from Port Dover, right? I'm from Port Dover, yeah. From that's Port right. Dover, yeah, yeah. Ontario, yeah. we have Ben Fakit. I love that. <laughs> Who is a professional production and AV tech, but he's also a volunteer worship team guitarist. Today's program, we're going to be talking about the volunteers, volunteer capacity, leadership, and uh, it's going to be amazing for you who are watching right now. I want to ask you to make sure you get a hold of some of your friends who maybe are involved in the volunteer work in the church or leadership in your church. This is a program you want to watch. So let's let's get into this. Okay. So first of all, just for the sake of our viewing audiences, I know we talked a little bit before we went live, but can each one of you um, just share what your capacity is um, in your ministries in terms of dealing with volunteers or if you are a volunteer and um, roughly how many uh, what's the size of the the ministry you're in and how many volunteers you deal with I know that's three things <laughs> but um, so first is the capacity so should we start with ladies first Londa really okay <laughs> ladies last <laughs> yes Ladies yes. last. Okay, so this one time only. This one time only. Okay, we'll start with Ben. Ben, talk to okay. us. Okay, so I'm from Calvary Pentecostal in uh, Simcoe, Ontario. And so we have probably around uh, 22 vocalists slash instrumentalists. We have about 10 people in support roles uh, for AV um, or, you know, it could be PowerPoint or anything like that. That's just, we have those type of people and they're constantly switching. Within that, we have uh, probably five or six worship teams that kind of get intermingled all the time and uh where i sit in that is uh i play guitar for it um but when they need to have uh someone who's professional to make some depression some professional decisions on what happens i will help the current ab people make decisions and uh yeah i'll work with whatever worship team needs me so awesome awesome dennis okay talk to us um, <laughs> i'm with as they said court right presbyterian church in guelph uh, for the last 10 or 11 years, I'm not exactly sure which it is, I've been the part-time worship technical director. What that means is that I'm responsible for uh, overseeing all the technical aspects of the Sunday morning worship services. Um, that includes, I report directly to our uh, worship minister, our worship director, and we have four, including the youth band, we have four worship teams. And the way we're structured I don't have a sound team or a video team per se. Each band has its own sound operator and its own video operator who's considered to be a member of the band. And so that's how we deal with uh, just keeping the, the technical volunteers and the musicians working together is, is by having those cohesive groups. So I would say all told, including musicians, we're probably looking at about 30 or 40 people, something like that. And actually in the booth, eight to a dozen, depending on whether the university's in session or not. That's amazing. We got to come back and talk about that, that arrangement between the tech and the, um, and the onstage people working together as a team. Like I think that's very, very unique and very important to talk about. Londa, you have not escaped. It's your turn. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I'm the senior worship leader, as mentioned. I'm also the, um, how do you say, the vocal instructor. Um, so I teach all the songs. I coach them on all the songs, get all the notes right. Um, I'm in authority, but under authority to uh, Mr. Joel Chambers, who oversees 
the vocalists and our dancers and flag bearers. Um, so in the department, I would say we have between 20 to 30 people, um, maybe 40. Um, it's about 25 vocalists. Okay, and then we have our band and um, and our dancers and flag bearers. So all in, all included, it's about 20, 20 to 40 people. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's now, let's get to, to the first question that, that I have on my mind is how do you cultivate or, you know, gather your team? You know what we found with the Rayma Christian Ministries, I have to say that I've been, I've been dealing with vocals for over tw about 20 years, if not 20, about 20 years with Rayma. And um, I find that with our church, we are known for praise and worship and the word. People are very much drawn to our church because of the praise and worship um, or the word. And um, we, our band is very well-skilled. We're dealing with um, high-level musicians. Um, our singers over the years um, have been very good, well, well, very well-skilled singers. And uh, the presentation is very good. Um, so based on that, I find that we've been able to draw people. They always want to know, but they are sometimes intimidated as well um, to come because of the level that they see. And I've heard that uh, numerous times, even in, amongst the congregants, you know, I don't know if I can get on and uh, how do I get on and the way they sing, I don't know if I'm good enough and blah, blah, blah. But um, we encourage, you know, just come on out. And uh, we talk to as many people as possible. If we know that there's vocalists, hair dancers, um, musicians as well. If we know that they're out there, then we try and talk to them. We do have, um, what, what do we call them again? Oh, oh, like a marketplace type of event where we will uh, advertise and talk about the different ministries that are in our church to get Cargans to be aware of what's in the church and to talk to the various leaders of those departments um, so that if they're interested, they can come in and you know sign up, uh, schedule an audition for the praise team, for example, because we do audition. We do that um, because we, you, you gotta be able to sing. You gotta be able to sing. You gotta, when it comes to dancing, you gotta be able to, to dance, are you are you fit? But our praise and worship can go for about an hour, okay? So because our pastor, <laughs> our pastor loves worship, and our congregation loves it, and so it can go on for a while. We 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 do get deep, and so because of that, especially if you're going to be a dancer, are you going to be able to keep up? Sometimes I watch our dancers and our flag bearers, and I am shocked as to the the fact that they're able to, to make, to sustain and the duration and they keep going. So all mm -hmm. of that, you know, when it comes to the musicians too, you gotta be able to play the, at the level that, you know, we're, we're singing at, at the level that we're playing at. Can you do that? Cause we don't, so while some chart, um, churches follow charts, we don't, everything is by ear. And so they, they're just able to pick it up. Even with me, I can't read. I can't read charts. I do everything by ear, um, which is which is a skill. Uh, so that's what we do. So if people mm -hmm. see the excellence that is being presented by, you know, the music that's there, the, the dancers that are there, the whole presentation, and they're going, oh, I don't know if I can make it. Um, okay, you make that initial, you know, marketplace opportunity where people can talk to you. Now, if they yeah. still say, I still don't know if I'm good enough, I still don't know if I should sign up, but I really want to, do you offer like a, a training or do you even say, yes, you'll audition, but then we'll train you to, to do um, whatever it is that, that they want to do? So in other words, if they want to dance, they'll go through a training process or uh, a, a period of time where they're being mentored and growth before they are actually put out there to to actually present right so when it comes to people that are unsure i usually say you know what why don't you come to some of our rehearsals first Perfect. and see how you like that and see what's involved um listen to the songs see if you'd be able to catch on because that's the other thing too you don't necessarily have to um 
know how to sing like me or know how to harmonize like me, but at least you got to be able to pick up quick, right? If you don't know how. So mm -hmm. when I'm teaching, you know, if you come to a rehearsal and you hear how I'm teaching and you hear the other vocalists, are you able, be, are you able to pick up the same way that they are as quickly? When it comes to the dancers, same thing. Go and see the dancers, see what they're doing. Musicians too, they're all welcome to come and to get a taste. Now, some people are like, yeah, I can. Some people are like, no, I cannot. <laughs> and the thing that I find too with churches is that for some reason, people have a hard time figuring out what their purpose and calling is. Mm. For some reason, people only believe that the callings that are in the church is the stage and that's it, right? They automatically, I, if they have a voice, I can sing, I, I should be on the praise team. Not necessarily so, because for example, if I could speak about the States for a second, singers are a dime a dozen. There's janitors that can sing circles around me. You know what I mean? So, so that isn't necessarily what your purpose is. You have to figure out what your purpose is and then go from there because not everybody's supposed to be on a stage, even though you may have the voice for a stage, right? You have to figure out what your actual calling is so that you don't get frustrated being misplaced. Very good point. Uh, we're gonna come back to you, Londa. Um, okay. <laughs> Dennis, <laughs> Dennis, how is the recruiting process on uh, at Cartwright? Well, um for starters, we're probably at the opposite end of the spectrum to so on this group. Uh, we we come out of a, we're in a single service format now, but we used to be in a uh, dual service format. And so we had a very tightly scripted, you know, this number of songs message, this not, and everything was because we had another service that was just like 10 minutes behind ours kind of thing. And then we have another congregation using the building as well. But because of the way we've set the worship teams up, um, each one is kind of its own entity. They have, each one has a different flavor. Um, for example, Sela, uh, they all have their own names. Uh, Sela there have a little bit of a country vibe to it. Um, Beer and Wings, it's a, an interesting name for a church band, but Carolyn Beer is their, um, is their basically their leader and they get a kick out of the idea of Beer and Wings. So we let them but um, they're kind of your standard, average, contemporary. They'll play the kind of stuff you're accustomed to hearing. So they kind of do their own recruiting. They're looking for people that work with them. If uh, Brian and Carolyn decide they need another bass player, then they'll talk to our music director, uh, Justin, and they'll say, Are, is there another bass player we don't know about in the neighborhood, you know, in the church and that sort of thing. We found out at one point that we had out of a church of a little over 200, we had 49 guitarists at one point. And so, um, and we had like 22 piano players. And, and so the thing of it is, we, so Justin's job is kind of keep an eye on where everybody is. Brian's been in the industry for years, uh, working with various groups. He's worked with Jacob Moon, he's worked with um, uh, Trevor Dick and various other ones. Um, and the same with Justin. The same with uh, the various other guys that we have and girls that we have leading the groups. So they go out and we encourage them to find somebody who's going to be a fit with their group. And that includes the technical. And it's, it's resulted in something kind of an interesting dynamic. <clears throat> Three out of the four, two out of the four bands, the technicians are all kids of the band members. Um, Probably our most skilled video guy, and by video, we mean the one that's working pro presenter and putting the words up on the screen and that sort of thing. He started doing it when he was nine years old. He's 15 now, and he's just brilliant at it. And he's the one that I have teach everybody else who comes along because he knows it four times better than I do. And so, but that gives an interesting dynamic to it and, and gives it kind of an organic approach, if you will, because just like you'd go looking for another bass player or another guitarist for your garage band that you play down at the pub on a Saturday night kind of thing, our worship teams kind of do the same thing from the pool of individuals within the church. And we even got actually one uh, drummer who doesn't go to our church at all, 
Um, but on the Sundays that the band he plays with is up, he's at court, right? And he's playing in the band and he's doing a wonderful job. And we're really glad to have Cam along. So it's a very, as I say, organic, holistic. I'm not sure exactly what word you use, but it's fit is really key to making sure that whoever we bring in, whether it's a musician, a singer, or a technician, that they are comfortable being a part of that group. And that's the really important thing, which is why we have the bands source their technicians as well. Because we want the technician that works with, say, Beer and Wings to be comfortable that another dentist does. And he knows Brian, he knows Carolyn, he knows how the band thinks, he knows how they're likely to perform. He's at all the rehearsals, he's at the planning sessions. If they decide to go out for dinner together, he goes with them. And so it's, it's like a church small group. It's almost like a little <laughs> church Bible study. And they operate very much that way. They pray together, they eat together, they fellowship together. And that helps them develop um, a cooperation between the booth and the stage that's kind of hard to do if you're just mixing and matching groups and technicians. Wow, how did that start? Because I don't think there's many churches that do that. Um, it yeah. started a bunch of years ago. Uh, one of our previous worship directors, Phil English, who's a missionary in Mexico now, um, he got the idea because we had about 40 people wanting to play in the worship band. And the previous model had been, we had one worship band. They played both services. They played every Sunday. They were in there all the time. And quite frankly, they were burning out. And so Phil got the idea, well, if we've got so many people who want to be on the worship band, then let's go looking for another model. And so at one point when we were running two services, so we'd have, um, you know, four Sundays, two services every Sunday in a month. We had eight bands at one time because there'd be the nine o'clock band and the 11 o'clock band for each Sunday. And each band only played once a month. And uh, now we're down to four, but it's the same sort of deal. They each band plays one Sunday a month. They've got a month to get ready. They can schedule stuff for the other Sundays. They don't feel burned out. They know, for example, Beer and Wings knows that they will always be on the first Sunday of the month. First Sunday a month, they're up, that's what they're doing. They can schedule their social lives around it. They can schedule their around their kids' soccer and stuff like that. And then when there's a fifth Sunday, that's when maybe we'll bring in a guest band or we'll put in the, um, uh, the youth band or something like that, give them an extra shot at it. Or and we've even done, okay, we got these four or five people, they kind of play good together, let's have some fun. We'll throw in an ad hoc group and let them have a Sunday. And so, yeah, the idea was to take maximum advantage of the pool of talent we had um, because so many people wanted to be involved and it was hard to say, you don't really want to say no, but and to try and avoid burnout by not having the same people up there Sunday after Sunday, two services a week for, you know, years on end. Okay. So with us, when we recruit people, um, usually we'll find out from the church that they're, uh, um, you know, that someone's talented in the church. And if, if we have a need for that, we're going to go after them and see if they want to serve. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we will recruit right directly from our youth group worship team. Like we want to start them young with our, with our church. So if, if they're talented there, we'll bring them in. And usually they'll be part of, we have a youth worship team that come, that plays every um, couple weeks or so, uh, as well as some other uh, worship teams that we have. They're just, um, we kind of just build the team. There's no, like, if, if there's a need in a, in a worship team for a Sunday, we just fill up, fill that space with somebody who's got that talented. So talent. So if we need a bass player, and that team is missing a bass player this week. We'll just use planning center and just add a bass player in there. Um, we'll do practices on Thursdays and, and we'll just fill it that way. But we always, if it's somebody who, if somebody expresses interest and they want to be part of our uh, like worship team, we'll, we'll have them come to a Thursday and we'll see where they're at kind of like Londa's and, and we'll see, if, you know, where they're at musically. We're, we're not too picky, but um, there is, there is a standard that we're going to stick to and uh, we play pretty modern music. And so we kind of expect to have, you know, more than a, 
you need to be you need to be a pretty good musician to be with us but you don't have to be crazy good so <laughs> but uh yeah yeah i um and our our sound techs uh, are on rotation that they could end up with any of our any of our teams uh they don't it, and it's whoever's on next and if somebody's away for the summer for that month somebody else will take their place for that couple weeks um we've got a few and we uh we rotate them so that they don't get burned out and same thing our worship teams uh they've got time off in between to uh work together and and there's not there's not that much pressure in our church that you you have to volunteer you have to that there's such a a crazy need but the people who volunteer want to be there so we don't have a hole because people who want to be on our worship teams you know they're going to make the effort to be there because they want to do it it's part of their ministry I think what happens if you, you've got to value the position first, you know, um, there, I've been involved with churches where it's, Oh, they're just the sound guy or, you know, um, I've seen times when, you know, the, the, during the prayers of the people, they'll pray for the staff and they pray for everybody, including the janitor. And they don't pray for the technical director. They don't pray for the sound guy. He gets locked out. If you don't value the position, you're not going to value the person in that position. So you got to kind of start there. If someone is valued in their position, they would probably want to give more of their self to that position too, because they feel like, oh, I'm valued in what I'm doing. So uh, there's the sense of, of them feeling validated in what they're doing as well. So that's, that's why I think it's important to value your, your volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I've noticed, um, two of you said that, that there's, an introduction of youth getting in. So it's either you source, you go straight to the youth. We need new people, go do the youth, right? And there are others that, that um, I don't know, it just seems like the, it just is a question that I have about getting youth involved. Some churches will, will embrace it. Some, ch some churches seem to shy away from it. Um, for those of you who, who get the youth involved, what's your process outside of saying we're looking for the youth like what how does that work for you and your churches or ministries uh, we'll know we if we if we have a concern about the youth we'll just ask the youth pastor like how's this person spiritually are they ready to to, to play on a sunday and uh we'll know and our church is full of grace for for musicians who are young when they're older maybe not so much but like when they're young we have we have grace for them to screw up and we can always turn them down in the mix uh, we also have uh, a few weeks in a month, we'll actually have people from our children's group up there. So we have three microphones out front and we'll have kids singing. And sometimes those kids are heard, sometimes those kids aren't heard, depending on where they're at, but we are growing those kids. And, yeah, and that's, that's what we want to do. Yeah, that's about mentorship too, Ben. You're kind of giving them an opportunity to grow. And uh, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. It's that's kind of the same thing as we do. Um, our youth pastors uh, or youth director, um, uh, Rowena and her husband, Frank, um, they have a pretty extensive youth program for both senior youth and junior youth. They have their own worship element to their ser to their services and their group gatherings on Friday nights. And they have bands, they have sound technicians, they have their own little sound system set up in the youth room. Um, they have guys and gals who operate that. And if we need someone new for, because maybe, um, you know, one of our operators has graduated university and darn it, they didn't stick around. Um, <laughs> then uh, we'll go to them and say, do, do any of your people who are doing sound for your groups, do any of them want to do Sunday morning? Do any of them want to come in and join us and be a part of that? And we'll, we'll find them that way. Or else, again, because the bands are actively involved in recruiting, um, then maybe, you know, maybe uh, John Fletcher will say, um, we got this, this, this guy, he's interested, he's been doing sound for some of our family band stuff that we do when we go to country fairs, you, would you be okay with him working in the booth? And, you know, I'll vet him, you know, we'll have a talk and he'll come to a couple of rehearsals. Um, but you know, often they're kids, you know, they're teenagers that work in the neighborhood. They're the, the kids, one of the band members or something like that. I think it's really great that a lot of my volunteers are coming from family. Their family of the band members are either their kids or their nephews or even brothers and cousins. 
Um, so that way we get them involved. We, we, we keep that family connection and, mm -hmm. and it starts to expand beyond just the group that's meeting on Saturday, on Sunday morning. And how do you, how do you encourage those who you think, you know what, you could probably pull it off, come sit in, you know? <laughs> well, the first thing is that's not my place because okay. I don't handle the band. That would be, um, our MD that handles that. But he's very uh, gracious when it comes to folks like that, that um, where he sees, you know, there's potential. Um, mm. So he'll still invite them um, to the rehearsal for them to sit in. Um, he also it has his own business where he teaches um, musicians. So he, he may invite them to be a part of that and train them in that way. Um, and then if they are not at the level where he needs them to be, he may offer them to start with the youth praise team like others because we do broadcast live and we do stream live so we do it is necessary that you're either able to play at the skill level that we're at or you know we'll have to place you here until you get to that place um, because we do need everybody to be at the same level uh, but yeah that's what we'd end Again, too, as the others had mentioned, we do pull from the youth praise team as well. We'll talk to uh, the youth leader and say, um, you know, can we use this person? We think they're at the place now. Plus, we may there may be a gap in our team where people may be on leave or, you know, people for whatever reason are no longer allowed, uh, able to be a part of the team. And so we need more people. So we'll pull on them as well. Because I, I, I have to say this, that, what I find in the church, whether it's um, the praise team or not, maybe it's other areas of the church, we 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 want to stay there forever, and you can't be there forever. <laughs> At some point, you gotta pass on the torch, mm -hmm. and so there needs to be preparation for that torch passing, and so you have to raise up the younger generation at some point and say, listen, we're gonna bring you along because I won't always be here. You know what I'm saying? And when we look at the word of God, um, when you talk about the worship team and so on, who are the Levites, in the Old Testament, I read the other day and I, I, I was actually shocked because I've read the Old Testament a few times, but I never saw this until one of our leaders um, mandated and said, we're gonna read through the Bible. And so when I got to this point in the Old Testament, I can't remember which um, book it was, but it talked about the Levites, probably Chronicles, and it says that the Levites were, once they got to the age of 50, that was retirement. I, I, I was shocked when I saw that. When they got to the age of 50, they retired and it was time for others to take over. So if I take that literally even for me, I got five years left. <laughs> Now, whether or not <laughs> my <laughs> I'm 10 years whether into not, overtime, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So whether or not my church is going to allow me to do that is another story. But we have to raise hmm. up the next generation yes. And, yes. and make them understand and make our even our leaders understand because sometimes they don't want to let you go either. If it gets to the point where I got to sit down now, that, I think that's, that's very important. I just wanted to say that for, for viewers that are just tuning in right now, um, we are having a great conversation about working with volunteers. We have with us uh, Ben Fakit from uh, Port Dover, who is a production AV professional and a volunteer worship team guitarist. We also have Dennis Gray, who is a technical director um, for the live services of of. Cartwright, I'm going to say it right, Cartwright Presbyterian Church, and we have Londa Lamar, La, La, I'm going to say it the French way, I'm sorry, Londa, <laughs> Londa <Sorry>. Larmond, <laughs> yeah. the French comes out, I'm sorry, <laughs> who is the senior worship leader at Rama Christian Ministries, and also in a Covenant, Covenant Award winning gospel artist. Thank you all for being here. Um, we talked, we just finished talking about the recruiting process, talked about um, the, getting the young people involved, the next generation involved. Um, what systems do you use to communicate with your volunteers? How do you organize them? I join with Ben. Planning Center is fantastic. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> planning center, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, planning center all the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the great thing. Those who don't know about planning center, uh, let's talk a little bit about that so that uh, people out there might know it's it's an amazing format to help connect all the artists, musicians, and, and leaders, uh, including having uh, file formats for music and you can do pre-recorded tracks for the uh, people to listen to that are part of your team. It's an incredible system. Now, especially, I'm going to say this more towards, well, I'll say to all, all of you, I know when I was involved in uh, worship team ministry, there came a time when it seemed like always the same people were being used um, to be on stage or to sing, to play instruments or whatever the case may be. And it almost came across, I heard this, this phrase, the 2080 rule, which was 20% of the people were doing 80% of the work. Now, in Dennis, in your church, I'm, I'm going to assume that that's not the case because of the way the setup is. Am I correct in making that assumption? Yeah, but it's maybe not as great as we'd all like it to be. It's probably more of a 30, 70, 60, 40 kind of a thing. Um, we are, we do have a wonderful, like even right across all the different ministries we've got going, we have a great uh, body of volunteers. A lot of people are involved in one shape or another. We have numerous youth leaders. We have um, the seniors groups are, are, are really involved. Uh, we have a huge seniors group, like 120 seniors in our seniors group, uh, something like that. Um, the other thing that's an interesting dynamic for us is our proximity to the University of Guelph. So we have um, a contingent of university students attending our church. And the inter what that introduces is this point where about you'll, you'll get this class of volunteers it kind of graduates out of the church and goes home and back off to other things at the same time that they graduate out of university and then we've got this class of freshmen that are coming in at the other end and so probably 20 25 percent of our volunteer base is kind of transient you'll see it hmm. go through the church and they'll be they'll come in they'll be here for four or five six years depending on their program and then they'll go back home to africa or the states or wherever else in canada they live and so that does give us the fresh um body of volunteers to work with from time to time and so um yeah it's in some ways, we've got a lot of the same old problems, but sometimes we've got our own unique ones as well. So, you know, you get somebody who's really good to talking about retiring at 50. You get someone who's just a brilliant technician on the board. He does. He's great. He knows exactly how to mix live sound really, really well, but he's going to graduate in six months. What am I going to do? <laughs> Yeah. Ben, how about with your church? I, I oh. guess I'm picking on them because I, I know they're a little bit on the smaller church side, about a hundred, you, uh, you said about 350, 260 people. Uh, yeah, I'd it, say, yeah, I'd say we do have that point where we do have um, like a smaller amount of people doing a lot of the ministry compared to the rest that just show up. But it depends on how you look at the church because the people who I don't see um, volunteering might be in the kids service might be helping there and you know they might be doing other stuff during the week so like from my view maybe maybe it's you know 20 percent are doing the work but in reality they're probably ministering somewhere else um in our church um yeah yeah we we have that but you know what's funny with our church because we're like a small rural church um yeah my family does a lot of the work like my, my mom used to run the choir. My mom used to play organ, piano. You know, I got cultivated through that playing guitar and uh, my brother plays <laughs> drums and my, my sister-in-law sings. So yeah, if you were to look at our church, you would think my family was involved every week, but we just, we've just been there forever. And there's other families that are like that in our yeah. church, but we're a small church. So we have to rely on families. Londa, how about in your church, which has about a thousand people to it, it's different a, size? It's a thousand people, but it's not a thousand singers. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it, it's everywhere. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you go, right? Um, 
it's just, I don't know. It, it, it's just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I would say too, that there's seasons where, Mm -hmm. you know, you find it, um, you'll find that there is less help in one season than there is in another. Um, I find, especially like during the, um, summer season, because people go away, Mm -hmm. you know, so what can you do? I mean, you, you do the best that you can with what you have. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's very important for people to understand. Um, so when you talk about the recruitment process, part of the conversation is, okay, this is what we do. This is the time that's expected. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is the commitment level that we're expecting because we have two services, right? So we have an 8.30 service and an 11 o'clock. So I said the 11 o'clock service, the worship may go on for an hour. That's not the case with the 8.30 because 11 o'clock service has to start. So 8.30 will be done by 10, right? And so they, there's, there's that break in between the hour break to get ready for the 11 o'clock service. So there may be times when you may have to do two services. You good? Yeah. Can you handle that? Yeah. You know yeah. <laughs> you know? So no, you're not good? Okay. What can you do? You know what I'm saying? That, that's only Sunday. Now we got the Wednesday Bible study. Then you got the Tuesday rehearsal. You're good? Still want to sing? You know what I'm saying? So all of that conversation needs to be there. And we need to have honest conversation. Don't Mm -hmm. tell me, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. And then when it's time, oh, you know what? I don't even have a car. I got to take the bus. Yeah. That shouldn't you. You need to be honest with me at the time of the, the recruitment when we're having that conversation. So I know what your commitment level is. It doesn't mean that you can't be a part, but then we got to work with what it is that you can commit to. And whatever you can commit to, I need you to do just that. Commit to that. Right? So if you said that you can only do Wednesdays, I better see you there every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right? Uh, My leader better see you there every Wednesday. There shouldn't be a conversation as to why you said you couldn't make it. Right? Because you said you could only do Wednesdays. No problem. Then we'll work it out. But there, and I find that we, I don't know why we, the, the, when it comes to the music department, I don't know about the other churches, but sometimes, at, you know, once everybody's there, all excited and stuff, but when after a while, it starts to slowly, you know, die down when, when they see the work that's involved and so on. And so that's when you got to talk about the burnout too. And, the appreciation and what do you do for them to so that they don't feel underappreciated because sometimes there is a lot of work there, there really is when it comes to worship leaders me being one of the senior worship leaders if the other worship leaders aren't there i gotta be there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right so yeah. the yeah. burnout is the, it, it can happen but what are you going to do um to show there, there has to be there has to be a give and take somewhere. I always, I gotta be there. You gotta help me. You gotta help me out. Cause people have lives. People have families. I'm a single mother of two boys. Mm-hmm. I also have my artist artistry that I do, and I also have a full time job. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Which is why I think it's really important that the church. part of that process is developing relationships with mm-hmm. all of the people that you work with. I don't just um, schedule volunteers. I don't, you know, just, you know, do training sessions with the new people. Um, I make sure that, you know, and networking is a huge part of what I do. We've got, you know, the space between the two services. When we had two services, the hour or so after the single service. Now, um, I've, you know, I have volunteers and I'm making sure they're doing the wrap up and the cleanup. I'm out talking to people. I'm out, you know, networking. I'm looking around. I'm developing. Okay, so what are you into? What do you do for a living? And because of the way we've structured our groups, all of my band leaders are doing the same thing. And all my other um, tech, uh, worship technicians are doing the same thing. We're all constantly working on the relationships, which is why, like, like my favorite one to talk about is Brian and Carolyn's group. They do just such a good job of it in that – even when they get together and they're going to sit down, they're going to decide how they're going to play the songs this week. 
these are the five songs we're doing. How are we going to do this one? Who's going to take lead? The entire group is involved in that discussion, even the technicians. Even Dennis, their sound guy, they involved. And, and they'll ask him, they'll say, okay, well, if we do this song this way, is that going to cause you any problems? Are you going to be able to keep up with that shift between the bridge and the chorus? And, and so they'll bring, and so we really focus on trying to develop relationships within the group so that if there is an issue, I know they're going to talk to me. If there is an issue, they're going to talk to Justin. And, and, then that's how we avoid the burnout. That's how we avoid um, the conflicts. You know, uh, nobody's in this thing alone. Nobody's bearing the entire burden. Um, I know that, that I can call Justin, my immediate supervisor about anything. And um, he knows he can call me. Heck, I'm on layoff right now. And he knows that Corbite is still my faith community. If he needs something, I'm not going to say no, because why would I do that? Yeah, that's part of the team, right? That's what you are. And knowing the strengths within the people that you work with and knowing how to utilize those strengths and bringing them to a place where they can do their part, whether it be um, running cables, or whether it be setting up gear, or whether it be hitting sound or doing lights or hitting or helping with the musicians or singing there's, there's that leadership capacity to understand where a person, where they are strong in and helping them develop that. Absolutely. And, and so, um, no, also, so I guess that was the part where I was talking about knowing your calling and knowing that not everybody is called to the ministry of praise and worship, that mm -hmm. there are other places um, where you may flourish and that you're supposed to be. And so I, that's why I think that the conversation um, as opposed to just, um, just I want to sing and um, I'm going to, can I audition and just get them up there isn't the only thing that you should do. There should be conversation. Why do you believe that you're mm -hmm. called to the ministry of praise and worship? Mm -hmm. What is it about the ministry of praise and worship that you think you're called to do? You know, what was, you know, what's that journey like? You know, what is it? Um, is it that, and this, I have a nice voice. Mm -mm. <laughs> you know that's that's not the only way way to know like what what why are you are you passionate about it and so i believe too that when you're committed when you're committed your passion will show or when you're passionate about it your commitment will show mm -hmm. you know what i mean so yes. when people aren't committed that's when i have to say are you sure that this is where you're supposed to be mm -hmm. is this really what you're passionate about Maybe you can sing, but you love children. Have you considered mm -hmm. being a part of the children's ministry? And maybe you can develop and raise up a children's praise team. Maybe that's where, you know, you, you flourish. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So are you, do you love people? Do you just love talking to people? Maybe you should be a part of hospitality. Yes, you yes. Know, have you considered exactly. that? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Two questions that are, have arisen now in my mind. One is having to do with find, are there tools that people can use to find what their calling is or what, where their strengths are um, that, that, that you can recommend? That's one question. So I'll ask that first. <laughs> uh, well, I guess, um, I don't know, there's a, there's a separation between kind of my professional side and what I do at church and the, what I, the amount of demand that uh, perfection for my job is different than what I demand for perfection from volunteers. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I can't, you know, if I'm sitting in the pew uh, listening to the service and there's a problem with the sound, I don't immediately run up and help the person with the sound. I have to give them that option to, um, to make, listen to those mistakes and, and change them. And I can't always be there to fix the problems. <clears throat> And the same mm -hmm. thing with being a guitar player. I, you know, I, I, it's, it's not my job to, you know, go up and, and critique the guitar player uh, in those teams. And, and we're, we don't have a luxury of, of having huge, um, you know, we can't just, we can't pick and choose a lot of times. Like we'll take what we can mm -hmm. get in our church. And, but we can figure out, you know, after a couple of weeks, if someone's going to stick around, we've had people who are super talented um, come in and they just didn't last because they couldn't commit. So I totally mm -hmm. understand Londa's, uh, Londa's thing. Like we've had, 
we've had very professional people walk in and yeah, they're, if they're not committed, they're not committed. But, uh, you know, if they are committed, we're going to keep them forever. Um, <laughs> cause we want them. And, uh, yeah, like everyone has to take up their, um, everyone has to sort of give in our church and, and, and make it work because, uh, yeah, otherwise there's holes and we're just small enough that we have to do that. But I think it needs to also be what's in your heart too. Um, you, you, I think, you know, when you want to, you know, I really want to be involved with ministry in a certain type of ministry. You, you kind of know, you know, if, if, if you're a Bible believer and you believe God can talk to you, God can talk to you about where your ministry is supposed to be as well. And he can talk about, you know, talk to you about like, Hey, you know what? I really feel just, with uh, the children's group. You know, I just want to help with out with kids or I want to help out with, you know, you know, talking to people, you know, that's, that's where I want to minister. Cause some people would be terrified to be up on stage and doing what mm. we're doing. Like it'd be absolutely, like, if we hand certain people who serve in our church, uh, churches a uh, wireless microphone they, they'll freeze right up meanwhile they'll talk to everybody else in the church as soon as they're in the entrance way they'll talk to everybody but you put a microphone in front of them in the front and they'll freeze up but they're still ministering in their area mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um for tools for training there's there's lots of tools for training you can you can definitely train someone to do sound you can definitely train people to do lighting video uh, pro presenter you can teach people how to um, get better at their craft, um, whether it's singing or guitar playing, they have to be willing to take that teaching, but, uh, there's definitely, you know, just pick this, you can find it online. You know, if you want to get better at sound, we'll watch a few videos and then have someone help you out with that. You want to learn better at singing. There's like a million singing videos out there. Now it's good to have somebody who can coach you through that and, you know, figure out what your needs are with that singing and what the church's needs are for that singing. Okay. I don't know that there's an app or a worksheet or anything like that, but I will say that um, we have a director of discipleship, Allison. And a few years ago when she came on board, the church set a goal to have 80% or better of the congregation involved in a small group study of some kind. And I don't know how close we are to that, but we are a lot closer than we used to be. We decided to hold a, a um, just a community Bible study, six-week limited community Bible study. We had 140 people showing up every week. And it was, it was just, she has just done such a wonderful job of developing that culture in the church. And that's where some of our best volunteer leads are coming from. Because in those groups, the people are developing the relationships, they're having the conversations, and you'll get a small group leader come to you and say, you know, there's a guy in our small group, I think would really be good at youth, or would really be good helping with maintenance or whatever. And because those, again, relationships, those conversations come out of developing the relationships within the church and having the leaders in those church understand where the opportunities to serve are. And uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything more powerful for any of this than, than just making sure you're, you're, you're developing a relationship with, with people. Absolutely. You know, um, I'm really blessed with a couple of the relationships I have on my team. Um, the team would not function as well as it does without the couple of three key people that I know I can turn to and say, Give me some ideas here. How do we deal with this? Where do we go with it? Outside of rehearsals, there's a relationship that needs to be uh, forged between mm -hmm. the people of the band. Uh, all yeah. of you would, would, would say that. Wow, we are almost out of time and there are probably there's a few more questions I wish I could ask. But I guess uh, as, as kind of a closing in the last few minutes that we have, we're going to just say, I know we've covered, we've covered quite a lot, but if we could could summarize three bits of advice or a few bits of advice, I'll say three, four, five, I don't know, <laughs> of what you would advise um, from your perspective, what you would advise um, leaders to remember, leaders who are overseeing volunteers, what they should um, consider or remember when dealing with volunteers. And also three, four, five, whatever the priorities are <laughs> of what volunteers should be remembering when when working in their in their area or working with leaders ben i know you're ready you have oh, a whole yes. list <laughs> yeah 
All right. So I, I kind of split these ones up. I was so pumped up uh, after we had that conversation on Saturday. Um, and I just, this morning, I just went through, made a little list. That's so I, I would say what we really need from leaders, uh, a few points is just equip your volunteers. You need to train them um, on their job. You need to maintain their tools. You know, they can't, you know, we need, we can't have bad music stands and bad cables. We can't have four XLR cables that don't work in our church. Um, we need to have budgets put in place so that people can make their jobs easier if they're volunteers as leaders. Uh, the one thing I noticed with certain leadership, not necessarily in our church, but in other churches, is we need to have your leadership uh, model good behavior. You can't have your, your, your leadership come in um, with your volunteers and start complaining about being there on a Sunday morning and how they're so tired or, um, you know, that it's, it's bad because your volunteers will reflect that. Um, same thing with showing up on time or early. You know, leaders need to do that. Um, I guess you need to trust your volunteers if you're a leader and make sure that you're not micromanaging. You're not constantly having to run to the back of the soundboard or micromanaging how they, how they're going to sing this line or whatever. Just let them do their thing. You can, you can, you can, you can help them later with that. Um, the other thing we have in our church is we need to, we really need to have leadership that uh, protect and block negative or offensive people from the volunteers. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have somebody who's doing sound and you have somebody who, you know, is deaf coming over and saying, like, you're not doing sound right, you know, you need to protect our volunteers. We need to protect our guitar players and our musicians because there's a lot of people who will nitpick and tear these people down and they need to, we need a good leadership that's going to block that. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I have on here is listen to dreams and visions well, when it comes to leadership, that we listen to these people who are up and coming and we just listen to, you know, listen to what their goals are. Like, do they want to, do they, they might be a, a singer now, but do they want to lead in the future? We want to listen to those goals. Do they want to be a, a professional musician? Well, we want to hear that. Do they want to grow from being just a PowerPoint person to being sound? We want to take those goals and really work on them. Um, have they watched a video on how to do technology better or a, a song better? Look, we got to listen to those, uh, those uh, things and and you know try out those ideas look at look at things that way um now from the volunteers uh, i've on here is just be ready to serve show up on time you know when, if you're a volunteer you gotta show up on time um on here i have uh remember who you're representing you know when we're up on stage and we're in front of people uh we're representing jesus christianity and the church you know and uh you might need to change your attitude when you're up there or when you're off there, when you're off the stage, when people see you, you know, in the front entrance way and all you're doing is complaining, you know, you're reflecting the church, you're reflecting what a volunteer is, who they, who they, even though you might just be a guitar player on stage, the people in church look at you as being a leader and you have to reflect that. Um, what I'd say to uh, volunteers is learn your craft the best you can. Uh, learn how to do your AV job the best you can. Learn how to be a musician the best you can. And work with the equipment that you're given. So whether or not your church has 20 sets of in-ears or you have one monitor to share between the whole band, you know, work with, work with what you're given because, you know, things might change. Something might catch on fire. You know, like you'd be able to work with, with, with what you're given. Um, practice, 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 practice a lot. And be willing to give that time up to do that. Um, what else do I have on here? Be prepared for ministry. I think this is one that because we're a small church, um, they, you know, there's just not enough people to go around um, sometimes. So you have to be prepared to pray. You know, if somebody else, you know, if we have a call and we need to, you know, take people off the stage for some reason, you need to be prepared. Um, you know, if something's going wrong in the morning, you know, you might need to pray for it. Um, and, you know, be prepared to be, to not just be an AV tech or to be a musician, be prepared to minister. And, I guess lastly, you need to work together as a team. You need to make sure that even though you might clash, you know, we, we might have a team that that's a, a group of people who don't know each other or who will not hang with each, out with each other after church, but you need to work with them as a team because uh, they're, they're part of the team. They're part of the church. They're part of the ministry. You need to work with people who, and some of them are difficult people, um, especially if they're really, you know, a certain type of musician who's super artistic they might have certain attitudes. They might have, you know, something, certain clicks about them, but they're really good at music, being a musician. But, you know, you might have to work with those attitudes. You might have to work with a bunch of teenagers. 
they have a whole bunch of attitudes. They might have some stuff that they're learning or working with, working with children. Children are scared when you put them in front of people. You know, you're going to have to work with that. You can't freak them out. You have to develop them. Um, and then working with your, your pastoral staff. If, if the pastors want to change everything on a Sunday morning, like we're, we're a Pentecostal church. So, you know, services change, you know, we might do three songs and then do something completely different and come back later. You know, that just happens and you got to be flexible. You can't be all, you know, all concerned because you practiced five songs and you only did three and you know, you might, you know, there might be an altar call in the middle of worship that might take the rest of the service off on a different tangent. You know, there might be, you just got to be flexible. You can't be um, so worried that, uh, you know, that, you know, practice so hard for this song and then we ended up not doing it, you know, just get over it. You're working as a team and you're working as part of a ministry. So that's what I would say. There's more points on here, but we'll, we'll just leave <laughs> that so that people can <laughs> bring up theirs. That is awesome, Ben. <laughs> Dennis and Yolanda, do you have anything to add to that? Oh boy, to add. Um, I would say, so for leaders, um, push for excellence, but recognize that you are dealing with volunteers and you are dealing with different skill levels, you may be. So, but still push for excellence. I think that in the kingdom, excellence should be the standard whatever that may look like in your local church. So you, you know what the, sta the excellent standard is in your church. I know what it is in my church. And so you still push for it, push for it. Um, and don't, don't settle. I don't think that we do that outside of the kingdom. And I don't know why in the kingdom we like to settle for mediocrity. I think personally, just me, Londa Larman speaking, I think it's unacceptable because if we say that we serve the king of all kings, he deserves nothing less than our best. And I believe that we should give it at all times as much as possible, where humanly possible, and then allow the Holy Spirit and for God to do the rest. Um, I think that as uh, Dennis had mentioned um, earlier, celebrate them, appreciate them, appreciate your volunteers, because at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is, is that should they not choose to be there, they don't have to be there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they really don't have to be there. So appreciate them. We're glad that you're here. And so find some way, even if the, um, you would hope that the church, that some, they may not be able to pay everybody. Um, so maybe ask leadership, is it possible for us to, let's take the team, the department out for dinner you know, and appreciate them. Let's get them um, cards, movie cards, so they can go take their family out or something. Let's all go bowling. Let's just have a fun night. You know, let's just, just, just to show our appreciation for all the hard work that you do, because it is hard work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of energy. And I can tell you from my church, <laughs> I tell people all the time, there's some day, some sun, no, not some Sundays, every Sunday that I minister for 11 o'clock because I'm a person, I put everything out there. I'm sweating by the end of it. I, I really, by the end of a service, could just lay on that floor and fall asleep right there. And I'd be good because I am exhausted, exhausted by the time. Exhausted to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Exhausted. <laughs> so true though. Exhausted. And so, you're tired you put a lot and not for the people but it's because I know what I'm called to do and so I understand that there are people coming in with so many issues and you would be surprised the amount of energy that they pull on you they're pulling on you without you even knowing it and so they're drawing from you drawing from you drawing from you and so all of that effort everything has been laid out on the altar I'm tired and so we want your, your volunteers want to be appreciated for everything that they've done for God's glory, you know, but, the, but they've also done it for you because without them, you wouldn't have a music ministry, right? So we need to appreciate them. Um, stay connected, check in, especially during this pandemic. Um, with our team, we check in every once in a while through Zoom, make sure everybody's good, have a time of prayer because you're not necessarily connecting again. You're not going to um, your church buildings anymore. 
So you can't forget that they're out there, right? Mm -hmm. You may not be doing worship again like you did before. Connect with them, see how everybody's doing, check in, have prayer. Um, that's something that we do. Um, when it comes to uh, volunteers, uh, what they should do with their leaders, they should also appreciate their leaders. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Uh, we try with um, our department every year at Christmas time, we find somebody that we honor. And I find that um, the church is still learning about honor, mm. honoring our leaders, honoring mm. our leaders. Um, because you, if you don't have leaders, then there's chaos. They're there for a reason. Mm. And so you have to honor them. And so we, we choose specific people and we give them Christmas gifts. We bless them. We have a get together at the end of the year and we just have fun and honor them. Literally tell them, we appreciate you all that you have done throughout the year. We know it's been hard and we thank you that you're here. Thank you for leading us. You've done an awesome job. It hasn't been easy. We thank you. Um, what else would I say? If you're committed, I think Ben brought this up, stay committed. And I talked about that as well. If you say that you're going to be committed, show it. Show your commitment. Actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actions speak louder than words. Um, definitely, like Ben said, learn your craft. We had spoken on a Zoom call with our uh, team and we said, during this pandemic, you should still be rehearsing. You should mm -hmm. still be practicing. And invest in yourself. Sometimes we depend on the church to pay for everything. Sure, we can take you to workshops and all of that. But you, where's the investment in yourself to do better? Because there may be churches that can't take mm -hmm. care of that. And so yeah, if you're really passionate about this thing, invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. Dennis's yeah. turn, because I know time's going. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to start by agreeing with everything that, yeah. that, that they've been saying. You know, it's, it's a gold mine. But whenever I am asked to do a seminar or anything like this, I always finish with two pieces of information. And it's the same for leaders as it is for volunteers. And number one is, and this has been touched on indirectly, but I'm going to capsulize it. Remember it's ministry. You know, just remember that that's what you're doing is ministry. Whether you're leading or you're a volunteer. You're serving God. Your volunteers are serving God to every bit that you are. You know, and if you don't think, you know, if, if, I always amaze at, at, at people who downplay the booth. I really am. That, that sound technician that's on the board there, they're the last people to have their fingers on your music before it goes out there. <laughs> you know, you know. So, yeah, remember it's ministry. And if you're a volunteer, remember it's ministry. You're not just phoning this in. You're not just sitting there occupying a seat in the booth. You are serving God. You know, Romans tells us, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you have a role in the faith building process, and that is to make sure the word is heard. And without technical distraction or without, you know, you got to do your job. So on both sides, remember it's ministry. And then the second thing, and I, I really just do not understand how we just fail to do this all the time. But Jesus laid it out really easy. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. You know, if you're, if you're a volunteer leader, treat your volunteers the way you would want to be treated if you're volunteering under them. And if you're a volunteer, treat your leaders the way you want to be treated if you were leading. It is such a simple rule to follow in all of our aspects of life. But for some reason, it seems to be the hardest one to follow. Mm -hmm. But for me, that's where most of it winds up when it comes to dealing with volunteers. Treat them the way you want to be treated. Hey, thank you, uh, Dennis, for that. And uh, yeah, wow. We have to, have to just, I don't want to do this. We have to wrap up our time. It, it's, we're gone over and that's good. I mean, it's been a great conversation. I've had a fabulous time listening to your words of wisdom. Uh, Londa, thank you for joining us. Ben as well. Um, this is going to be uploaded onto YouTube. Uh, the GMI Hub TV, and this conversation is going to be there for you to check out a little bit later. And there's also videos up there of our previous interviews for you guys to look at 
a great resource you don't want to miss out on, a GMI Hub TV on YouTube. Just join us there. Don't forget to subscribe. We need your support right now, and we really appreciate it. And just remember that we broadcast every Monday uh, between 7 o'clock Eastern time, 4 o'clock Pacific time. So join us again next Monday uh, when we will have another set of panelists and we have another discussion uh, more on the business side of the music. But for now, we say thank you again to our panelists. Ben, Dennis, and Londa, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. And Dale, thank you for being my co-host today. <laughs> thank you, Cheryl, for being my co-host today. There you go. And, <laughs> and we thank all of you for being with us. And we hope to see you again next week. Bye for now. Bye.